This week we'll be talking about programming languages. Um, I'm dividing the discussion up into three areas. First will be about low-level languages, then about high-level languages, and finally about program design. And so we'll start with low-level languages. Basically, as you know, a computer is some kind of a device that can store, retrieve, and process data. That's it. Um, how it does it is the magic under the hood, right? Um, basically, the, the programmer provides instructions and data. Those are the two different components, right? So the instructions are telling the computer what to do, and the data is what it's going to be working with to perform those operations on. So machine language is the ones and zeros. It's the very base language that's the only thing the computer really understands uh, you know, by itself without some kind of interpretation or compilation or some other, and we'll talk about those as we go on. But machine language is instructions that are written for a particular processor, sometimes even for a particular machine. So if you have an Intel processor, that may be very different than another processor. Um, and the instructions that are part of what we call the instruction set may be very different. Now, in class, you guys looked at the little, uh, little man computer, which you wrote some assembly language in. And that had instructions that you used, like um, load or add, sub, um, quit. Right, some instructions that you had um, and store in address, STA, and so on. Well, that was a set of instructions that were specific to that little man computer, and those instructions would not be able to be used on any other processor. And that was a simulated processor. But those instructions are taken and turned into binary code so that the computer can process them, can actually do something with them. Okay, so every machine, every processor has its own instruction set. And it's the, the logic of the CPU, the central processing unit, that takes those binary representations of actions and data and actually performs some kind, some, some kind of operation with them. Okay, so this is an example. We didn't really talk about how the binary code is set up, but this is just an example of one processor, how one sets it up. It has a word that is 24 bits, so each of these little squares represents a bit. And the first eight of that, of the 24, are for the instruction. And then the last 24 are for the, the data that it's going to be operating on, or a memory location, or whatever. Okay, but most likely data. So if you take these first eight bits, which are the instruction, then this breaks that down a little bit more so that the first four are for the operation code. We often refer to that as the op code. So that would be lo like load or halt or store or add. That kind of thing would be the operation code. One bit in this architecture is for an inst the register that is going to be acted upon and the last three are for some kind of an address, like out in RAM. So this was going on behind the scenes of the little man computer that you did the coding for. Maybe not exactly like this, but the same idea. So the operation code tells what is going to be done. The register specifier tells which register you're using. And the addressing mode tells um, how to, so how to interpret the operand part of the instruction. So these three bits are saying whether we're going to be um, accessing or storing whatever the operand is. Okay. So for an example, let's say that the op code is 000 in this particular set. This is um, a simulator called PEP9. It's similar to little man computer. Um, so in PEP9, 0000 is for the halt or stop. Um, and 1100 loads into a register, in particular the A register. Often registers are referred to as A, B, C, um, or X, Y, Z. Okay, and this, so this one loads a whole word, so that's 24 bit. This one loads a byte, so that's 8 bits. And this is storing a 24 bit word, and this is storing an 8 bit byte. And then 01. 1, 0 adds, and 0, 1, 1, 1 subtracts. So this is very 
a very few codes that exist in the the slide presentation here. There are a lot more codes in the PEP9 simulator, just as there are more in the little man computer. Okay, so this would be the opcode, the first four bits of the specifier. So here, for example, 1100, that is load a word into the register, A. So zero is the register, so that's probably zero refers to the A. And then here's all of the operand, that's 16 bits for the operand, so whatever that means. So the, the our instruction specifier, the operand, hmm, this is kind of weird, isn't it? Okay, the, this is the whole operand, and this is the same thing. Not, oh, except that it has a different specifier here for the, for the operand. So notice this is 000, this is 001, and this brings in a different operand. So those bits are different than the ones above it. So it's just going out and getting the data. Um, this is an example of an add. So it's, again, adding, and we have the operand. So the idea is that every processor, so every machine language that exists, uses this kind of setup where you have an indication of what the action is going to be performed, where it's going to perform it, and how it's going to perform it, or getting the data that it's going to perform on. So as a longer example, here we have an instruction that is load H into the accumulator. So 0010 loads something into the accumulator is register 0 in this case, it looks like. And then here is the H. That's the code for H. And if you just convert this into hexadecimal code, we end up with this over here. Okay, and this is a store and a load I. So it loads the letter I, which is HI. It's one more. Oh, no, it isn't. It's because it's an uppercase H and a lowercase I. Okay, and then it stores it and stops. Right. Now, what we did in the little man computer was not the binary instructions. We had something in the middle that was like an assembly language, which is a, a more user-friendly way of writing code rather than having to write binary instructions. Okay. So assembly language it uses these mnemonic codes. So mnemonics are things that are easy to remember, that, that represent. So. Um, the example would be like STA was store in um, an address, right? So STA is a mnemonic code for storing in some specific address. The assembler takes that the code that the person has written in assembly language and turns it into the machine language equivalent. So it turns it into binary code, and that's what the computer can operate on. Um, something I just want to mention, well, in finishing up here about assembly language, because you guys have already done some assembly language code, I'm not going to go into more detail in it, okay? but um, if you have questions, be sure you let me know. Um, pseudocode is a way of representing what's going on in a program in words, not so much in code. So you have written code in, um, let's see, Turtle and um, TK Inter. And the code that you wrote there is understandable. You can look at it and you, and you can understand, but you're using specific syntax like def function parentheses colon. That's something very specific to Python. Pseudocode is writing out the logic of a program in words that then could be adapted to any programming language. So it's, it's more about the planning of a program than it is about the implementation of the program. There are many different ways to write pseudocode. This is one example. Um, there are other ways that involve using different symbols, um, but not, again, not specific to a programming language. As you go on in programming, you will be required to use some pseudocode and try it out and decide on a way that works best for you, that you think is understandable by others, but also makes sense to you. So here's a sample of an algorithm. So an algorithm is a step-by-step -step listing of 
finite steps to follow to accomplish a task. So it has to be, oh, they have to be unambiguous. You cannot have, well, sort of. Like if I were to write an algorithm, well, here, let's say here for preparing a hollandaise sauce, we'll just use this example. This is an example of pseudocode also. You'll notice um, it's written sort of in English, but not in a programming language, and not as you would write a, a, a paragraph in English either. So it's somewhere in between. So, um, let me give you, turn on the burner. So turn on the burner is a, one concrete step. Well, it's a, a, it's a step. What's confusing or maybe ambiguous about this is what temperature should that burner be? Should it be low or should it be high? So in a way that is not a concrete step. It's, it is ambiguous because if I were to put the burner on high, it's very likely I'd burn my hollandaise sauce. Right? So when you're writing an algorithm, you need to make sure it's very clear. And it means probably that you're going to end up having to write more and be more and more specific about um, what it is you're actually trying to accomplish with each step. Um, so they have to be completed in a specific order. For example, you can't um, put other ingredients in the blender if you haven't. Well, no, I guess that's put it after. You have something cooking on the stove here, and then you're putting it things in the blender. Well, you would not turn the blender on and then put the things in. They'd fly all over the room, right? So those two things need to be in order. And that's the idea of it being a sequential series of steps. Um, there has to be an end. Now, it, this does not actually have the end. Leave on the burner, put it in the blender, turn on the blender, pour in the content for, in slow stream. Pour contents, contents of what? I guess, of the pot. Um, okay, so it, this kind of has an end in that when the blender is turned off, your holiday sauce should be done. But it, it's also kind of vague because you don't know if you're supposed to blend it a long time to try to make it like frothy or sort of like whipped cream kind of thing or what. But in any case, there is an end. We can assume from this algorithm that when the blender's turned off, you're done. So sequential list of unambiguous steps that are finite and that solve the problem. Okay. When you have write a program, no matter which language you're using, a low level or a high level language or any other kind of actions you're doing in your life, um, when you are developing a possible solution for that, you should think through what is a plan to test it to see if it works right, right? So in the case of the hollandaise sauce, it, there would be a taste test at the end to see, or maybe pouring it and seeing if it's the right thickness or whatever. Um, so you need to develop a, a test plan. And that test plan may involve looking at the code. So actually just putting the code through a syntax checker would be an example of code coverage. Data coverage would be if you are um, let's say you're writing a program that involves asking for someone's age. Well, you want to make sure that the whoever is running the program can't enter a negative number or can't enter a number greater than, what, 130. So that is a data coverage kind of testing that would be done. So as a part of your testing plan, you need to consider both the code aspects but also the data. And in most big projects that you work on, the test plan will be an actual document that is written into your whole proposal, into your whole project documentation, um, so that anyone who's looking at your project can understand how it's being tested. And the test plan needs to make sure that it covers all possibilities. You know, did the, did the user type in an age under zero? Did they type in an age over 130? You know, and then testing it also with a good age. Right. So you have to make sure you cover all your bases when you're doing testing. Okay, so this is just sort of a summary of kind of the topics. So the low-level languages that we think about are machine language and assembly language. Those are both considered low-level languages. They are the most direct in terms of accessing the resources of the computer. Of course, the machine code is the most direct but it's really hard to write. 
and the instruction sets for assembly languages and well and for the binary instructions the binary instructions had two parts they had the part that was the opcode and then the operand and assembly language is using mnemonic codes yeah. and finally the idea of testing okay, that make sure that no matter what programming language you're using make sure you have a robust testing plan. This is especially important, of course, if you're going to be publishing your application that you've written, because people need to be able to rely on it. Okay, so that's sort of an introduction to low-level languages and some other sort of generalized programming concepts.